Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the academic series first session of the Reproducibility Journal Club at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, I'll be presenting today. My name is Fiona Ramage. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Edinburgh. I work for a research team called Camarades, where we work on evidence synthesis meta-analysis. Um, and I, I'm particularly interested in rodent models of mental health illness. Today, as a bit of a, a gentle introduction or a refresher to reproducibility, we thought that we would, uh, well, I'll do a quick reminder of kind of why we're all here and why we should care about this. And then I will move on to, well, there's a, a blog post written by someone who has tried uh, open research approach where they compare it to uh, a buffet. Uh, so I thought we'd go through that and kind of draw comparisons between open science as a concept and like buffets. Um, on this screen, there are also all our social things, but I'll show those again at the end. So just to talk about reproducibility and research, I, you know, we all work in very different fields, I'm sure, but the overall concept is the same. Typically, when we want to test something, we'd come up with a hypothesis design uh, an experiment or several experiments to test these hypotheses and then collect data and eventually interpret and disseminate it. Um, when we think about disseminating our findings, words, buzzwords that often appear is we want our findings to be novel, we want them to be highly significant, we want them to be high impact. But what I'm going to argue is I don't think that people consider often enough are our findings reproducible. So to even talk about what reproducibility is, I think it's, it's a complex concept and many different definitions exist. Uh, the definitions that we're going to use here is something a lot closer to like, if you were to do the same or a similar experiment, would the findings hold up? Would you find the same thing again if you were to test it again? So there's been talk the last decade or two about a reproducibility crisis, and this appears across fields. A survey by the academic publisher Nature in 2016 uh, asked 1,500 respondents whether they had failed to reproduce an experiment, either their own or someone else's, and about 70% of people on average had failed to reproduce uh, someone else's experiment and 50% have failed to reproduce their own experiment, which we can all agree is quite worrying. Uh, the reproducibility crisis was talked about quite early in the field of psychology, um, where it became quite evident. So. Uh, when during in a sample of studies, 97% uh, of them had statistically significant results, so you know, p less than 0 0.05. And when replicating them, only 36% of replications had significant results. So there were only 39% of replicable studies among this pool that was examined. This obviously isn't unique to psychology. Like this is also this was also tested in preclinical cancer research, um, where findings were confirmed in only 11% of papers. So we can agree that there is a bit of an issue with reproducibility and it's good. It's been talked about quite a lot in recent years, but it's maybe not as wide reaching a concept as we'd hope. So hopefully um, discussing it in platforms like today uh, might be a good step in the right direction. There's obviously like downstream consequences of reproducible research. Um, either doing irreproducible research or basing your subsequent, your kind of downstream research on non-reproducible findings will lead to research waste, such as, well, research your time and funding. Um, there is risks to animals, you know, loads of like waste of, of animal models, essentially. And um, if these findings can, are then lead to clinical trials, it could lead to humans being administered either ineffective or unsafe treatments. It's not unheard of that an irreproducible finding can like generate a whole subfield, which then, you know, lots of research is produced and none of it valid, essentially. The issues with it is non-reproducible research is very prevalent. It's sadly a little bit encouraged by the current research climate. And the example that I'd want to draw here, especially is pressures to publish, which may make people prioritize these novel and highly significant findings over re reproducible ones. And in my opinion, for now, there's insufficient incentives for alternatives 
uh, like to, to well for example open science and things like that is it's not always rewarded as well as it should be so people are less inclined to do so uh, to be a bit more optimistic there's a lot that we can do about it uh, the first thing is just talking about it but there's uh, like there's many different reasons why findings could be non reproducible so there's many different kind of avenues we can go down to try and improve it but education and training around methodology, study design, particularly thinking about like statistics and sample size calculation and things like that, and also just general research practices. We can also emphasize reporting, encouraging research to pre-register these studies and write high quality papers that report clearly and transparently everything that was done. We can also try and change research culture, favoring transparency and open science over this kind of slightly more almost toxic approach of just pressuring academics to publish as much as possible. So when we talk about open science, sorry, I forgot to mention that. Uh, obviously that's the, the kind of what the session is about today. So it's important to give a definition. So here it says open science refers to the process of making the content and process of producing evidence and claims transparent and accessible to others. So it's really about, yeah, being clear about what you've done and why you've done it, but then also making everything openly available. And then, like I said, uh, another thing we can do is just have many discussions around it and try and raise awareness of these issues and maybe share a bit more about what we're doing to try and avoid it. So yeah, that was um, an intro introduction to reproducibility. And now I'm going to cover uh, the second part of this little talk, which is uh, a blog post written on the blog Cocktails. Uh, this one was called the buffet approach to open science this was uh, a talk about from uh, uh sorry this was a post written by an author who had experiences with trying to adopt open science practices themselves um and throughout the blog post which i would recommend reading uh they compare it to to a, a buffet in a restaurant and how the same rules apply to open science as do to a buffet in a restaurant so essentially the author uses three rules that apply to both buffets and open science. And I'm going to go through them one by one now. What we're supposed to do as well is the what they mean by the buffet approach is ideally what we want to do is encourage researchers to pick and choose the elements of open science that fit a specific either project, career stage, or just the person and the support they have to be able to achieve it. Um, yeah, so the first rule of a buffet and also open science is you might not be able to try everything. There's obviously a million different options that exist for open science and there's some options that won't be open to you. Uh, for example, it might not fit your diet. Uh, it might not be possible for for everyone to um, to adopt all open research practices, just like it might not be possible for everyone with a certain diet to try everything at a buffet. It's not black and white and there are, um, you know, it's a, a kind of many shades of grey. And like for diets, you can consider like alternatives that are appropriate to your diet. So the example that the author gave here was they were maybe unable to share raw video data that might have, for example, pay, um, you know, like clinical information in it or uh, like study participant information, so then you're not able to share raw video data. But what you can do is you can share, uh, you can share modified data, you can share little clips of these videos, or you can share a transcription of them, or you can share the video metadata, like for example, when, where it was recorded, how long the videos are, and things like that. So it's not black and white, and there are options that you can consider. It's also at a buffet, like an open science, you don't want to try everything all at once or it'll be incredibly overwhelming and hard to do i'm not gonna lie like open science approaches are a challenge to adopt until you get used to them it's a lot of effort and trying everything all at once is a great way um, for everyone to be put off essentially there's many different options and flavors available for different research practices like i said uh, so maybe try and be aware of them and select ones that are more suitable to you. 
Uh, for example, the author gives the example of pre-registration. So uh, different flavors are available is you can write registered reports where you get your, your study methods peer reviewed. And then if you conduct the study as planned, um, it can be published. There is for pre-registering, you can pre-register before data collection, you can pre-register after data collection, but before data analysis, or you can do both. Uh, there's many options available and consider which one is best for you. The second rule of a buffet and of open science is you don't have to try everything at once. You can adopt some open research practices without adopting others and every step you do make is like a good step forward. It doesn't matter if you don't do everything. Um, it's not all or none. You can pick and choose, mix and match and just choose what's right for you. So like I said in the first slide, um, that can be what's suitable to your career stage, your project, and just the support and the, the research environment that's available to you. Uh, don't stuff yourself or it really won't be enjoyable. I think some of us have made the mistake of just trying to do everything perfectly from the start and it is really overwhelming. Is you can also think that you may have the issue of not having enough support around you to do all these things and without having the kind of know-how, the experience of knowing how to do it, it's it's a big task. Again, I do recommend doing it, but it's a lot easier when you have support. So I would advise going down the avenues where you do have the right support to, to be able to do that first or just learn little by little, adopt them. Um, one by one and like I said it's incremental improvements any step is a good step Ooh. oh that's pretty much what I said uh but um yeah here it says uh if you feel overwhelmed try and sample one new dish for every visit so one new practice for every for example paper you write um whether that's sharing methods share, like sharing data um yeah. The final rule of a buffet and of open science is to label everything. For open science to work, we need to be transparent and we need to document everything. So in the case of a buffet, this would be you could think about either publishing a full ingredients list or you could think about publishing kind of more minimal stuff, like at least the key allergens that are present in a dish. So for open science, you can fully document everything or you can document the key elements that you want to focus on. For open science, we want to be transparent around the methodology we adopted and the decisions we took in our research process, like why we did certain things and made certain choices. There is, for documentation, there's kind of two different sides to it. There's something that's encouraged by your institution and there's some stuff that you will have to do yourself or uh, with the support of your research group. Um, we want to know, for example, what we'd hope that institutions would provide is what does each open science practice entail and why, how is it useful? Um, in the author's opinion, institutional guides are currently insufficient uh, for what's going on. So a lot of it is kind of has to be a bit self-taught or hopefully with the support of research group. Um, as part of your research group, it's also easier to focus on good documentation and the scientific process, why you did what you did, rather than the results. Um, and something that the author suggested would be helpful would be to develop standards or templates that would be reusable to make it a lot easier and also to make your research more consistent with each other. Um, is to just develop these kind of blank templates that you can fill in and uh, yeah, be able to reuse and therefore be be consistent and open and save a lot of time and effort. The author concludes by discussing whether the buffet approach to open science is the right way forward. Uh, there's been arguments that allowing researchers, well, like, yeah, people who are kind of a bit opposed to, to a buffet approach would suggest that allowing researchers to sample and take their time means that there's a very slow or no improvement and a perseverance of questionable research practices, right? Like, um, like there wouldn't be fast enough improvement if everyone just took their time. Uh, but the author strongly disagreed with this point. 
uh, incentives, so rewards from you know publishers or institutions that might reward our, our open research practices are changing and improving. There's more and more encouragement of open research. Um, it's also clear that one size fit all does not work. Um, like even when we think about how different research is so different among different fields and different types of experiments. And uh, we also don't want to remove like research or cre creativity or anything like having diverse approaches to a problem is valuable and we don't want to kind of restrict this by imposing very rigid open science standards. Um, a final concern is um, something called open washing where people might try and make it seem because of, you know, essentially appearances, try and make it seem like they had done all these open science practices without actually doing them, just saying that everything was open and essentially outright, outright lying. Um, so I hope that's a minimal issue, uh, but that's still a concern with a, uh, yeah. So in conclusion, uh, what we should do is we should keep ourselves honest about the approaches we've taken, why we've done what we've done, uh, document everything that we've done well for others and for our future selves. And the key point uh, from this talk is basically that we all have to start somewhere with these open research practices. So start with what you like, what particularly appeals to you, and then, well, learn as you go along. So yeah, that's the, kind of the end of the first part of this meeting. Um, so I want to point you towards where to find more of these meetings. So as reproducibility in Edinburgh, we tend to have monthly meetings on Fridays. I think we were going to try and do the second Friday of every month, but this will be confirmed. Uh, but it is, it is still on a monthly basis on Fridays. And here are all the different channels you can sign up to to receive updates or also just have more discussions amongst yourselves. Uh, the, YouTube, the YouTube channel, which you can find by just using the search function and typing in Edinburgh Reproducibility, is where we will post videos of the sessions afterwards. Uh, our Twitter, which again, using the search function and typing in our name, uh, will lead you to it. This is where we tend to post uh, about future events and useful resources that we might find. You can also meet us on Teams. Uh, so here we are under the EORI branch, so Edinburgh Open Research Initiative. Uh, so search from that from Teams and we can maybe post a link to it. Um, and since we're part, since reproducibility is kind of like a, a one of EORI's projects, you can also go on edopenresearch.com uh, to learn a bit about more about what EORI are doing. Uh, so. Emma, I think you can end the recording now.